the title of my talk is Optimizing Phosphorus Management for Multiple Benefits. You can see that part. Hopefully they won't all be like this. So, you know, this should be familiar to, to all of us. You know, a lot of human phosphorus use and management happens at the farm scale, the level of soils and plants. But one of our big challenges, of course, is that the phosphorus doesn't stay there, right? It can run off in stormwater and cascade downstream, where there may be potentially unintended consequences when that pea gets where we don't want it. Right? Once downstream, phosphorus can have unintended consequences on the so-called goods and services that we receive from the natural environment, what we dub ecosystem services, things like clean drinking water. Right? But we've got a big challenge in <coughs> managing the downstream impacts of P. And one of these challenges is that the inputs and outputs of excess phosphorus in the environment are often disconnected. So we've already had our first reference to the Maumee River. This is the biggest watershed in the entire Great Lakes system, which is the biggest freshwater system in the world. The biggest watershed in the biggest freshwater system in the world, right? That's why we're going to be talking about the Maumee River a lot today. What I'm showing you on this graph comes from one of our RCN members, Steve Powers and Company. This is a really great product from the RCN. What we're looking at on the bottom is just uh, time. And then up above, we've got total gross inputs and outputs of phosphorus estimated for the Maumee watershed. Everything that goes in, everything that goes out. You can see over decades, there's a mismatch. They don't line up. For years and years, the inputs have exceeded the outputs. How does that work in terms of mass balance? Where is this phosphorus going? How do we account for it? There are disconnects over time, as shown in this graph, and also over space as this P moves down through the watershed. And despite inputs exceeding outputs for decades, we still don't see decreased outputs in response to decreased inputs yet. Inputs are going down, outputs aren't. What's going on there? It looks like there might even be a little trend in increase in, in, uh, in outputs. Well, we think that a likely place is the soil. Why is there this disconnect here? Why is there this gap between the black line and the white line? What can account for this difference? Well, we think it might be soil. So this is an example not from the Maumee River watershed, but from the entire country of China. This comes from another one of our RCN members, John Bo Shen. This is an, on the top an estimate of available soil phosphorus in China from 1980 on the top. In 1980, about 80% of the land had soil Olson P values of less than 10 milligrams per kilogram. Now we fast forward to this bottom image here. Now we're looking at 2006, 26 years later. Average soil available Olson P has skyrocketed. And on arable lands, now, I'm sorry, yeah, so, right, so sorry, so yeah, 79%, 80% of China had less than, less than, you know, 10 milligrams per kilogram. By 2006, less than a quarter of China was hitting that. In other words, more than three quarters of the arable land in China at this point now had soil Olson P in excess of this value. The take home message from this image is that phosphorus is accumulating in the soils themselves in China. But this is not unique to the geography of China. This is essentially a universal phenomenon that is largely dictated by soil mineralogy, texture, and management practices. But it's really important to note that not all phosphorus losses are from excess P applications, right? So I think one of the themes that came out of Steve's talk for me was that we can't put this all on farmers, 
right? So we have to be careful in how we interpret some of what's going on here. This isn't necessarily all from excess P application. What I'm showing here, this comes from Laura Johnson at Heidelberg University. This is showing phosphorus loss associated with fertil fertilizer application just prior to precipitation events. And this is from uh, uh, the Honey Creek in northern Ohio. The blue in the bottom there, that's showing water discharge in Honey Creek. These black dots are showing dissolved pea concentrations in that water. And the red bars indicate the timing of fertilizer application. What you see is that when a fertilizer application happened to occur right before a big precipitation event, lo and behold, phosphorus concentrations went up in the water. So this gets at, you know, we talk about in terms of management the four R's, right place, right time, right source, right? So this is right rate. So here we've got an issue that is not about rate, but rather about the timing and potentially placement of that fertilizer. It means it's a little bit more complicated. Farmers could be following the right you know, recommendations as far as application rate, but that might not be enough. And in fact, here the, on the left, we're seeing results from a survey of farmers in the Maumee River watershed. What we've got here on the bottom is the amount of phosphorus recommended for the rotation that farmers might be using. What we've got in the vertical axis, the y-axis here, is the amount of P the farmers actually added. Above that line, those black dots indicate where farmers added more P than was recommended. The white dots below that line indicate individual farms in the Maumee watershed that added as much as or less than the amount of P that was recommended. In the Maumee River watershed, 70% or more of the farmers are adding the recommended amount of P or less already, right? So in terms of application rate, you know, it's not always an issue of excess P addition. But meanwhile, even as farmers are by and large following application recommendations, losses of dissolved P have increased from tributaries within this region. This is set up a little bit differently on the right. These are not all actually tributaries of the Maumee. The Maumee is shown. These are all tributaries of Western Lake Erie. And even as you know, farmers are following application rates, adopting conservation tillage practices, outputs in the rivers continue to go up, leading to these harmful algal blooms in the western Lake Erie Basin. So here on the left side, we've got western Lake Erie, the bottom left corner there, that urban area on the far <laughs> the bottom left, that's, okay, all right, so let's see, here we go, there we go. Right. So that's Toledo, here's the, the Maumee, is coming out right here, the sediment plume is from the Maumee River. I believe this is the 2011 bloom. And so this highlights the challenge, you know, uh, this, this larger challenge that we're all facing, that, that managing for crop productivity isn't enough. Even responsibly managing for crop productivity, following recommendations, we're still seeing these impacts. You know, this is the, the Lake Erie is responsible for providing us with lots of different ecosystem services, from clean water to economically valuable fisheries and tourism. So now this raises the question, can we manage agriculture to achieve benefits aside from just productivity? So this is just a, a totally hypothetical little figure that we put together where we're showing, you know, ecosystem service metrics and just a kind of relative hypothetical scale versus just a hypothetical scale of increasing soil phosphorus. Right? So if we're just thinking about crop yield, we might target a soil P somewhere over here. 
with potential impacts to maybe biodiversity, maybe potential impacts to phosphorus losses. Well, can we instead find a way to, you know, optimize here where there's maybe not major impacts to crop yields, but fewer impacts to biodiversity, less phosphorus losses? How do we, how do we get there, though, right? There's, you know, there are costs involved, and that's what Steve was saying, too. If we make this too onerous, it's never going to happen, right? The, the people who are trying the hardest will wind up going out of business, and then where will that leave us? You know, so we need cost-benefit research to make this a reality, and we need to focus our attention on what benefits we really desire, what costs we're willing to bear, how we can spread those costs around so they're not too onerous. You know, there's a wide variety of different ecosystem services that we consider, from provisioning us with food, to providing us with clean drinking water, to tourism re and rec recreation. We often think about you know, clean water and food are really tangible ecosystem services. Recreation and tourism are responsible for a lot of value in our economy, too. Those matter. You know, when Lake Erie looks like pea green soup, there are impacts to things like recreation and tourism. There's also a wide variety of potential phosphorus-related impacts. Which ones do we want to focus on? Which ones are our priority? Which ones are a problem in the specific location we're considering? Not every ecosystem service is equally impacted in different locations and different systems and different cultures. And the impacts also vary from place to place. And this, this comes, cut off on the bottom, this comes from a recent paper by Graham McDonald and Company that recently came out of our research coordination network. Well, one way that we can focus our thinking is reminding ourselves that oh yeah, we apply the P at the level of the, the, the field and the plants. And that's really where we have the greatest capacity for direct phosphorus input stewardship. And as you move through the watershed and the phosphorus gets further disconnected in space and time, it gets more complicated to deal with more expensive to deal with. That there's a wide variety of different practices we could potentially implement to address this. They all have different costs. They all have different benefits, right? But the key point here is that changes at the small scale can benefit the entire system, maybe starting with the four R's, but moving on from there. So I wanted to provide a little example of one of these potential methods, soil P drawdown. Ah, if soil P has accumulated, maybe stop adding P fertilizer. Here's an example for China. They did that for nine years. What we're looking at is crop yields with and without P application. They stopped adding P over nine years. It didn't go, yield didn't go down. Meanwhile, now we're looking at the same colors. The green line shows the P drawdown treatment when they stopped adding P. P losses went down dramatically without a reduction in yield. That's great. But there can be trade-offs. We've moved in our area towards no-till and conservation tillage away from mold board plowing. That means that the P isn't getting incorporated as deeply and it's getting what we call stratified. It's getting focused on the surface of the soil where there's greater opportunities for it to run off this can happen even when you're following the four R's. And this might be one of the factors leading to dissolved P runoff causing these harmful algal blooms. So then this raises the question, well, what does a more holistic approach to P management look like? We can implement all aspects of four R stewardship, right? Right source, you know, maybe using recycled sources of P, the right rate based on soil tests, maybe even incorporating so a buffering capacity, matching the timing of applications to crop demand and precipitation, applying the P below the surface to prevent runoff. But each of these things comes with a cost. And our major challenge is addressing this question, what is the cost of maintaining water quality relative to the benefit of high crop productivity? 
Now, there's a wide variety of possible changes that could be implemented. We could change our soil P testing from simple MELIC-3 to considering soil buffering capacity and soil P storage. These are costs, right? So in conclusion, now this is a complex issue. P sources and impacts aren't connected in time and space. P loss occurs with, <coughs> without excess P application, right? Now managing P gets more expensive and complicated, potentially, depending on, you know, the further you get from the source. But we have to remember that the benefits of small-scale solutions at the point of application can cascade to provide benefits at the large scale. So agricultural management should involve more than one ecosystem service, but this is limited by a lack of knowledge about costs and benefits and, you know, a way to bear those costs. But We've got to find a way to come up with a holistic approach to pea management because that will provide multiple benefits on a wide scale throughout the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I think we have time for a few questions before we have the next uh, short presentation from the RCN. So fire away, please. Thanks. I don't need, I don't need okay. Sure, I think I'll just, I'll kind of take it out a little bit more broadly and I think your comment highlights the fact that one size fits all solutions may not be possible to find and that the appropriate solutions are going to be context dependent at the scale of, you know, farmers potentially and other, you know, sources and the more information we have and that we can provide the users, the better they can make decisions about what's appropriate. And then maybe we need to find a way to help share those costs. Looks like one more, one more question. Do we have any more? Okay, don't uh, see any volunteers. Thank you, Mike, appreciate that very much.